Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to introduce Kathy Reed, and I'd like you to join me in giving her a warm welcome. Can everyone hear me okay now? Thumbs up? Fabulous, thank you. There's a couple of things I wanna do first. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet today on the traditional lands of the Agambi people. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and to their leaders emerging. And I warmly welcome any Indigenous and First Nations people in our audience today. Secondly, I'd like to acknowledge that this conference is entirely the product of volunteer labour. And I'd like you to thank, join me in thanking Brent and Craig, our volunteers today, for their labour. Thank you. The third thing that I'd like to talk about today, before I start the talk proper, is a content advisory. I'll be talking frankly about breast cancer and topics like mastectomies. This talk contains images of a breast, a real one, mine, with a plaster cast, and you'll see images of mastectomy prosthetics. Some people might find this content confronting or distressing, and if this isn't the talk for you, then I'd like to provide a gentle, respectful opportunity for you to choose to be in another space. You might want to see Benno's talk on what Unix cost us, or you might perhaps prefer Martin Kraft's talk on what makes decentralisation hard. But just be aware it may be confronting. I'll also be using humour in my talk today, and there'll be lots of puns, only the breast ones. <laughs> because one of the privileges I have as a cancer survivor is to make fun of the terrible experience that is cancer without trivialising it. Laughing about cancer and cancer jokes can sometimes feel awkward or inappropriate or somehow taboo. Life is short and I'm choosing to spend more of it laughing. So now you know one thing about me, let me introduce myself properly and provide you with some context. I'm Cathy Reid, and last year I was on what you might call an adult gap year. One of 16 students from across the world undertaking a Masters of Applied Cybernetics at the Autonomy, Agency and Assurance Institute, the 3A Institute, says it on the T-shirt, in Canberra, run by distinguished professor Genevieve Bell. You might remember her as one of our wonderful keynotes from LCA 2016 in G-Town. During this course, we explored a range of topics, but they all relate to how cyber physical systems and artificial intelligence go safely to scale. And in particular, the nexus between humans, technology, and the environment. My talk today is an outcome of that year, and my intent today is to share with you part of that journey. But first, a history lesson. Oh, no cheering. <laughs> but first, a history lesson. <laughs> Woo! Because all technology has a history. Can anyone tell me who these women are? Uh, Rachel first and then you. Absolutely right. So on the right, we have Miriam Mazzucani, the first woman to win the Fields Medal in the uh, area of non-Euclidean non geometry. And yes, she died from breast cancer. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, okay. that, was, that was Maya. Yes, on the left. Mm. The Empress Christina. Uh, absolutely correct. I didn't think anyone would get that. Well done. Yes, this is Empress Theodora, the wife of Emperor Justinian. Uh, she was around in the 6th century and she was a, a uniting influence in the early Eastern Orthodox Church. Then to the right we have Rachel Carson, uh, the author of Silent Spring. She raised incredible awareness around the dangers of pesticides. She got DDT banned in the United States. And if anyone's a fan of Motown or Soul like I am, you'll recognise Dusty Springfield. 
and Rachel, you nailed it right on the head. The thing that unites these four disparate, diverse women is that they all died of breast cancer well before their time. And we're left with a lingering question. Given more years, given more time, what other greatness might they have accomplished? Every technology has a history, a genealogy, a line of antecedents and pioneers. And unfortunately, I'm in the best of company. But this story doesn't start with Empress Theodora and her unifying influence in the Orthodox Church. It doesn't start with Rachel Carson and her enduring legacy of pesticide awareness. It doesn't start with Dusty Springfield and her proclivity for the preacher's son. It doesn't start with Maria Masakani's non-Euclidean geometry. This story starts in 2010. On November the 14th, to be exact, which, as it happens, is the feast day in the Orthodox Church for Empress Theodora, Saint Theodora, for nothing is ever a coincidence. This story starts on the 14th of November, 2010, with three small words. The next six months are a blur. Major surgery, pathology, it's fast moving and aggressive. It's already spread to my lymph nodes. Many, many rounds of chemo, a life-threatening infection. I'm touch or go. But thanks to science, some, <laughs> yay, some incredible practitioners and the women who've previously walked this road, I make it through to the other side. That other side is very different. I'm 31 years old, in instant menopause. I'll never have children. My body has been decimated by 200 stitches and a range of poisons. But I'm still here, <laughs> too stubborn to die. And it's time to rebuild. My surgeon, an empathetic, wise woman, asks me about reconstructive surgery. There are several options. They're all huge, risky surgeries with a very minimal outcome. None of them will make you look anything like you looked before. They'll just make you slightly, look slightly less terrible than you do now. Than you do now. I asked her a question she wasn't really expecting. <laughs> How many USB ports can you give me? You know, I'm going in for a hardware upgrade, you know. <laughs> I want an upgrade. And so begins the story of Sense Breast. And I might call on Brent's help here uh, for some show and tell. According to figures from the Breast Cancer Network of Australia, only around 12% of women who have a mastectomy, which is the technical name for removal of a breast, will have a reconstruction. Instead, to look normal, we wear these. They're silicon-based prosthetics. They do their job adequately. They're serviceable, but nothing special. <laughs> a bit like instant coffee. <laughs> they degrade over time, <laughs> like this one has. It get hot and sweaty in summer, and well, <laughs> no USB ports. <laughs> what a great opportunity for open hardware. <laughs> and I'll get Brent to show that around. So, step one. <laughs> For anyone replicating this project at home, safety is really important. Make sure your workspace is clear, make sure you commit your code often, make sure you have good ventilation, make sure you have some safety goggles. <laughs> oh yeah, and don't die from cancer. <laughs> Step one, don't die from cancer. So, as part of the Masters in Applied Cybernetics, we were given a term project to create a cyber physical system, something that had sensors, something that collected data that embodied some of the theory that we've been learning about during the semester. And so I started thinking, what might be possible here? How could I combine something that harmonized, that synchronized both the electronic elements, the cybers, and the very physical, tactile, human experience 
of wearing a prosthetic. <laughs> of course, I had to give the project a name and I didn't think I'd get away with calling it Titbit. So, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it ended, see, laughing, best medicine. It ended up being called SenseBreast because it combines the cybers, the sensing, and technology, the physical, the human elements. So let me work you, walk you, work you, walk you. <laughs> let me do the thing. Let me walk you through the first iteration. First, the cybers. So I used a Raspberry Pi 3B plus, a Sensat, lithium ion battery. I did use a case, the case broke, RIP case, SD card and <laughs> a range of swear words and I speak a couple of extra languages. <laughs> there were many swear words. So I deliberately chose the Raspberry Pi 3B Plus because I'd worked with it before. I knew it had decent networking capabilities so it could connect to a five gigahertz network. And in my experience, it was a much more robust model than the Pi Zero, which has a much smaller form factor. The Pi 3B is a bit gruntier, but it had a much bigger form factor. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay, because probably for the first time in my life, I was grateful that I was a larger person, because <laughs> it gave me a bit of space to play with. <laughs> so the other reason that I chose the Sense Hat is it worked out of the box. It had a bunch of sensors. I didn't have to solder them because I've got like great big giant hands and soldering is meh. I don't like soldering. Anyway, Sense Hat sensors out of the box. So this is what it looked like. It was a bit fiddly, but I got there in the end, just screwed the sense hat onto the Raspberry Pi 3B class, flushed it with some uh, Raspbian headless because that's how we roll. My next challenge <laughs> was to get it on the WPA tour. <laughs> the WPA tour authenticated network at ANU. Have I mentioned how much alcohol I drank that semester? <laughs> no, no, don't mention that. <laughs> They'll be scared. So ANU uses WPA2 authentication and it uses two-phase uh, MSCHAP2 as the authentication handshake uh, as part of WPA2. Trying to get this to work in a manually configured WPA supplicant file <laughs> under Raspbian was, as they say in the industry, a good learning experience. Um, basically what I had to do here was figure out how MSChat2 did the authentication and my password hash there, it's a dead password, um, is an MD4 hash that I had to create using OpenSSL. But, too stubborn to die, generally stubborn, this is a triumph of the semester. You see the thing circled in yellow? That's my Raspberry Pi being allocated a DHCP lease off the ANU Secure Network. Woo! Yes! <laughs> Booyah. So, the lesson that we draw from this is that there's a tension between prototyping and hacking on things, and the fact that those things exist in a world that's designed to constrain and shape and nudge us into certain behaviours. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. So my next step was to acquire power. <laughs> good, Catherine, be good, Catherine. Okay, so one of the things I was concerned about in prototyping the sense breast was how to power the device because it's supposed to, you know, sit there independently. You know, I can't walk around with, you know, a USB cable. Well, I could, but probably not socially acceptable. Lithium ion batteries like this one can get quite hot. <laughs> and I did some testing with this on the Raspberry Pi and found it had about seven to eight hours of battery life. So as a prototype, it was generally pretty good. I also tested it inside my clothing <laughs> because I had images of me walking around with magic smoke emanating. <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, would make a really good war story, <laughs> but possibly not all that healthy. <laughs> um, but in the end, I found that it didn't heat up too much, so it was reasonably safe to have it positioned close to the skin. The code for this project, of course, is openly available on GitHub, so I'm not going to spend too much time going through the code. 
I'll cover some of the broad brush strokes instead. Essentially, there's a Python script which uses the inertial motion unit. Uh, and the inertial motion unit can measure uh, both movement in three axes, so x, y, and rotation. And it can also measure the acceleration of that. So whether I'm moving slowly, whether I'm uh, accelerating, or whether I'm decelerating. So the IMU can measure all that data. The Sensat also includes temperature, uh, humidity, uh, and something else that I've forgotten, sensors. We'll see them in a moment. And basically what I did was wrote some Python code. <laughs> this is my first-ish foray into Python. Um, wrote some Python code to take the sensor readings uh, continually for five minutes, and then they get dumped out to disk in JSON format. And so I wrote a cron job, which basically starts the device up on boot and starts taking the readings and writes them to disk every five minutes. So every five minutes, chunk of JSON. Every five minutes, chunk of JSON. I like JSON as a format. <laughs> but trying to figure out what's going on, we needed to visualize it a little bit. Can everyone see that OK? <clears throat> so this is a data visualization that I fed through D3JS of temperature, pressure, and humidity. I knew I'd forgotten one of them. Um, and you can see here that in a five minute period, the prosthetic takes thousands and thousands of data point readings. But one of the problem, problems that I had with the data is that there's a significant amount of variance there, just over 300 seconds, over five minutes. And you can see the humidity, which is the, the green dots there, rising over just five minutes. So this is a five minute sequence straight after boot. And what I figured out was that when you put the prosthetic on and then you start to walk around to get sensor readings and it's, you know, <laughs> 35 degrees in Canberra, <laughs> you start to sweat. <laughs> and so the humidity reading <laughs> started going up. The other thing that I found really interesting that I had to uh, dig into a little bit is that you can see there that the uh, temperature actually goes down after the start. So what's happening at the start there, keep in mind that this is a five minute period taken just after boot. The temperature is actually higher up there because it's doing a whole bunch of boot processes. So the CPU is working harder, which is actually turning the temperature up on the device and the sensors are picking up on that. So as an accurate data capture device, I still have, a, still have a fair way to go. But what I was able to prove here was that I had an independently powered mobile data capturing device that, oh, hang on, I need to wear it. Next slide. So I had some electronics working, but what I didn't have working quite yet was a way to wear it. So let's see. I grabbed some medical grade silicon, some rendering, <laughs> some plastic. <laughs> There's also a chisel in there somewhere, and I'll talk a little bit about that. There were knives. I used them. And my original plan, <laughs> you can see here my serial killer starter kit. <laughs> My original plan here was to take a silicon mold of my remaining breast and use this to create a breast form to put the electronics into. This <laughs> nope. <laughs> this is a complete fail. So in my first iteration, I didn't use enough silicon to get very good coverage because curvature and large surface area. Um, so yes, I didn't use enough silicon to get very good coverage of the breast, and so it was very, very thin, and I couldn't create a mould out of it. Um, but because this was for an assignment, <laughs> and I was doing deadline-driven development, what I did instead was get the silicon sheet and get the plastic box <laughs> that my prosthetic came in, and then layered acrylic texture over that in layers. So I put a layer of acrylic over, let that dry, put a layer of acrylic over, let that dry. 
then I got the chisel, sanded it back, you know, really, really, you know, hacky, hacky stuff. Then what I did, because that wasn't particularly comfortable to wear, I lined it with some uh, calico, Spotlight is my friend, and basically stuck it all together with PVA glue. So completely total hack job. I did remove the paper clips afterwards. Then what I did was put the Sense hat and the Raspberry Pi into the polystyrene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I learnt my lesson. And stuck, <laughs> stuck it all together. And then the battery, which you can see here, basically fit on top of that. And then all of that got shoved into a mastectomy bra. <sighs> so, step two, better. <laughs> USB ports. But the initial prototype was clunky. It was uncomfortable. It wasn't the best breast. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm sorry, not sorry. <laughs> what else was possible? Let's find out. So about this time, <laughs> ABC got word of what I was up to in there. <laughs> and they came and they interviewed me. You can see me here with me trying to pull my serious face for <laughs> I, I don't wear my serious face very often. Because, <laughs> you know, I don't always talk about my breasts, but when I do, it's on, you know, national television. <laughs> or for a live and recorded audience in LCA. And John Oxer. Hi, John. John got wind of this. <laughs> And you might know John from the Open Hardware Minicom from the incredible work he does with assistive technologies. And he sent me an email which went something like this. Hey, Kathy, Awesome project. I have some suggestions for making it even better. Yes! Version 2. Let's take a look at the board that... John says we collaborated. I say that John did a huge amount of work on this. We collaborated. So let's take a look at the board that we collaborated on. So it contains an IMU, just like version one. And we can determine motion in three planes, just like the sense hat. And it has temperature and pressure and humidity, just like the sense hat. But we also discussed including a volatile gas sensor, the BME 680. And the key difference is that the BME 680 can do gas detection. So you can sense, excuse me, various substances, methane, carbon dioxide, and this can be used as a crude air quality detector. <laughs> For example, if you're in Canberra and you have no air quality. No, seriously, on a scale of 0 to 200, Canberra's been topping out at like 5,000. Yeah, sorry, Canberrans, please take some air with you. The other change that we made here was to include an OLED board, which makes it easier to display data without needing to connect the Raspberry Pi to a HDMI monitor. Because you don't always carry a HDMI monitor around with you. Well, not always. And so this is what phase two looks put together. <laughs> we have the custom SenseBress board. Uh, you can see there's a lovely message on the OLED screen. Breast conf ever. <laughs> and there's a whole bunch of extra libraries that are needed for this board. But John and I made the decision to make sure that all the components had a Python, were all Python compatible. And it meant that we don't have to keep switching between, say, Arduino, the Arduino IDE, and Python. So you can code everything on this in Python. I won't go into detail on the libraries that we used here, but I'll be uh, very happy to chat about it in a break. So I'd like to pause there for a moment to reflect on the power of collaboration, the hallmark of open source. Every technology has a family tree. To get to this point, version two of SenseBreast, We've used components developed by Adafruit, 
Lemo Freed. We've used the Raspberry Pi as a development platform developed by Eben Upton in the UK. In turn, the Raspberry Pi uses the Raspbian operating system, a derivative of Debian. And Debian, in turn, embodies principles of distributed development and software freedom that was conceptualised along with the birth of the internet in the 1960s and 1970s. Together, we don't just do good, we do better. So, again, the problem. I have some kick-ass electronics. So I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that word. We have some super electronics. So we still have the problem. What do I put them into? Because I don't want to be walking around with a hacked, chisel, plastic monstrosity. Not useful. Technology isn't better unless it's better for people. Uh, and there is some nudity in the next slide. So I tried again. And this time with the silicon, I used a lot more. <laughs> Actually, I used 12 times more silicon <laughs> this time around. I didn't want to underdo it. What I built this time, though, was a supporting infrastructure. And you can see there there's a plaster of Paris cast over the breast, which has plaster of Paris rope at the top and underneath where the breast joins the chest wall to provide a supporting infrastructure. And what this meant was that as the silicon dried, the plaster of Paris dried as well and provided the support for the silicon. And this worked a lot better. So you can see here, the white at the top is the plaster of Paris mold. Um, that came apart as I was taking the silicon out of it. So it's not particularly robust, but it did its job. What we have here is the, like the wrong side of the silicon, um, but it's the silicon, very thick silicon shell that I was then able to use to take a cast off which we can see here. So this is the other side of the silicon cast. And what I've done here is use a different type of medical grade silicon, much slower to set, that then takes a mold of where my breast would ordinarily be. Would you all like to see it? Yes. Yes, excellent. So here we have <laughs> sense breast mark two. And I'll get Brent to take this around after I describe a couple of things. So feel free to play, touch. I know how to make it now, so if it breaks, I know how to make another one. It's much more flexible. So this fits into a mastectomy bra much more easily. It feels much nicer to wear. <laughs> and feel the weight in that. It's a lot heavier than the first iteration, but it actually matches the weight of my existing breast quite well. So for me, uh, it gives me balance as I'm walking, and that's quite important. Otherwise, you do things like throw your shoulders out. Then what I did at the back was basically get a Stanley knife. <laughs> You're seeing the theme of knives, aren't you? It's okay, I'm not dangerous. And popped the sense breast with the custom sense breast board, flush into the breast like that, and in my bag of tricks over here, I created a silicon cover for that as well so that the battery can stay on that. It has another layer of silicon and then it goes straight into a mastectomy bra. So a very, very good iteration on, uh, on its predecessor. Overall, <laughs> it's a much better breast. <laughs> yes. So, USB ports, check. Better sensors, check. And a breast form that looks and feels like a real, well, somewhat like a real breast. So using collaboration and building upon the open source efforts of others going back many decades, I was able to achieve this. We've gone from good to better to breast. Now, 
we can think about how this technology in turn might be built upon. Could sense breasts be used to help women recovering from breast surgery by better managing movement, by providing data to physiotherapists and other health professionals to ensure that a range of movement is maintained? Could sense breasts be used to help predict and manage the often debilitating side effects of breast surgery, such as lymphedema, which is often worse in high humidity and high humidity is predictive for lymphedema? Could sense breasts be used to design better mastectomy prosthetics for women affected by breast cancer to make them more comfortable, <laughs> more affordable, more durable, more sustainable? I'm not a medical professional. So I can't answer these questions. I've simply played a very small part in helping to develop something that might help others in the future. I'd like to conclude this talk with some reflections and provocations on gathering data from health and other wearable devices. Data from wearable devices, from fitness trackers, from mobile phones, is increasingly being privatised. Instead of the data that's collected about us by Fitbit or our watch, our prosthetics, instead of that being owned by us, that data is instead being gathered and stored and warehoused and treated as a corporate asset. We have little control over how this data is shared, how it could be used against us for example, to calculate health insurance premiums based on the data captured in wearables. Indeed, the health insurer John Hancock in the United States has now adopted an entirely interactive business model where premiums are calculated from fitness tracker data, from a Fitbit, a Garmin, an Apple Watch and so on. And as we saw earlier in the data visualisation of SenseBreast data, the data that is captured is often incomplete. It doesn't tell the whole story. Who will be disadvantaged by this? And so, in my view, it's imperative that we have free and open source alternatives. Alternatives that put us in control of the data that is gathered about us. Alternatives that aren't just free, they give us freedom. Every technology has a history and equally every technology has a future, a through line, a trajectory. What history are you going to leave with the technology you build? Thank you very much. I do have time for questions, and I know that Brent has a microphone. Is it, do you have to reverse the, thanks for the talk. Um, <laughs> do you have to reverse the um, mold considering it was of your other breast? Uh, very good question. Um, so basically, uh, what Caitlin's asking is, did I have to reverse the mould because I took it of my left breast and I was doing the cast for the right breast? Um, I thought about that, <laughs> but I figured the granularity of the cast was, wasn't particularly fine grain, so I figured I would get away with not reversing it. It's a really good question, though. Um, we've done some work with uh, Wi-Fi through the skin and various um, meat analogues, for the want of a better description. Um, have you done anything with uh, Wi-Fi or wireless through the silicon? Good question. I haven't done anything in that space. Um, and I think if I can perhaps think about where that question's leading to, it's instead of this being a wearable, does it become an implantable? And I gave that serious consideration. 
ethically as a term project, cutting myself open and <laughs> the three A is pretty, you know, gives me lots of, you know, space. I didn't think they'd be too comfortable with that. But I think it's a really good next step for this space. I think sooner or later we're going to have uh, a lot of implantable devices, not just the um, AICDs or the pacemakers that we have today. Uh, so I think that's something that we really need to be thinking about. Good question. Uh, how well does the gas sensor work when it's inside? Is there a vent that allows air, outside air, to come back in? Sorry, I missed the, the question. Sorry, there's a, you added a gas sensor, um, but I noted you cut our, you said you put silicon back on the outside of the, yep. the cast. So is there another way that air can get back inside to reach the gas sensor? Yep. So the, the silicon that goes over the top of the pie isn't airtight. It allows it to breathe for a couple of reasons. So if that silicon was airtight, the, the processing temperature within the Raspberry Pi would just heat up considerably. So there's basically a ridge that goes over that allows some air to get in. You then have to consider that this is all then placed in a bra and then you might have two or three, or if you're in Canberra, seven layers of clothing, you know, <laughs> over the top. So I think it's a really good point about the validity of the gas sensor given that it's in a very enclosed space. I don't know how to solve that. Patch is welcome. Uh, thanks for sharing very generously. I, I think it's, um, it's very interesting. And although uh, some of the specifics might not necessarily apply to everyone in the audience, I think that um, the, uh, you know, some of the, the general lessons you learnt are quite useful. Sorry, that's not a question. My question is, um, are, are there any uh, electrodes for the heart rate monitor or how does that work? Yeah, so I didn't quite get to doing the heart rate monitor. Um, I've played around with heart rate monitor. Oh, it's, uh, it's expandable. Exactly. <laughs> no, no, don't, don't say that, punk Catherine. <laughs> Be good. <laughs> um, code of conduct. The, um, so with the heart rate sensors that I've used previously, they need skin contact, and a couple of them work in different ways. Um, so some heart rate sensors use pulse oximetry, and they basically figure out um, the light difference when, as blood's pulsating through the vein. Most of the ones that you can break out of a Raspberry Pi are something like that. I have a problem. I have a problem because I had so much tissue removed. I don't have a lot of veins to take a heart rate from. You know, I can take it from. <laughs> sorry, guys. I could take it from anywhere else, but I can't take it from where, yeah. Yeah, where the breast was removed, unfortunately. But basically, you have to have some form of skin contact. I'm not quite sure how I would do that. Maybe it's a lead that needs to come out, or maybe I need to design a, a plate that sits on the chest wall. There are actually um, sports bras using that, that have an electrode built into it. As far as I can tell, only one brand, and they haven't made any since 2010. Oh, wow. Yeah, they partnered with the English hockey team, and I don't know why more people have made them. Maybe the heart rates have gone into watches, or we're gathering heart rate data somewhere else. That was um, really cool. Thanks for sharing all of that. Um, have you got plans for um, improving um, the uptime from the battery you've got, like you know, turning off a core or two and um, uh, using the Raspberry Pi um, A plus, that sort of thing? So you uh, sort of you know <laughs> increasing the availability of you know, <laughs> my breast. Um, <laughs> the <laughs> No, no puns, be good. Um, I would like to, except that I'm going into a PhD program this year, and I suspect that my free time <laughs> will be um, somewhat reduced. But there's, a, there's quite a few things that I'd like to do with it. For example, how do you reduce the form factor? How do you have some sort of CI or CD loop so that the data, the JSON that's generated, goes off to a server, you know, a server that you own, that you trust, that you can do something with? How do you then feed that into some sort of actuation system? For example, when humidity is really high, lymphedema is really bad, and my arm swells up, and 
I'm supposed to wear like a compression thing. Compliance isn't my forte. And um, it's conceivable that I could get an alert on my phone that says, you know, the humidity is really high. You should really be wearing that compression, compression sleeve. Many things that I could do with it, but I probably won't have time to. No other questions? Um, a lot of the universities are doing research in um, the collection of this health sort of data with things like Fitbit. Um, obviously, um, researchers get access to data sets for those specific people who participate in those things. Are there any projects that you're aware that have software or data sets that are actually open that we can go and have a look at to um, extend the capabilities there? Because obviously you want to do a service and you want to have something that allows you to, to give you some feedback around that. Mm -hmm. So I, I know there are projects doing this, but are there any open ones? I'm probably not the best person to answer that question. And I know that we have Dr. Vanessa Teague in the room up the back there. And I know that she's done some work in this space. And I don't mean to put you on the spot. But I know that I'm not an expert in this area. Um, so I, I don't feel like I have the, the scope to answer that question. I, I don't know if Vanessa would, would like to. I was actually going to ask you more or less the same question, or at least a slight... <laughs> Oops. Um, because I really, really very much agree with what you were saying towards the end about you wanting to have control over your data. So I was going to ask maybe the opposite question, not so much about university projects, but whether you've ever looked at... There are projects for collectives of people to get together and voluntarily share their data with each other so that they can all take advantage of whatever inferences are made from the group. Did you ever look, do you know anything about those kinds of projects? Uh, not in the mastectomy and breast cancer space. Um, so as far as I'm aware, since breast is the only sensing mastectomy prosthetic in the world, it's, it's a world first and it's open source. <laughs> So if there are any other women who've had mastectomies who'd like to wear the sense breast and share the data, that's something I'd love to explore. But if we look at other communities like Open APS and the people with um, type 1 diabetes who, who loop, you know, who um, get much better results from open hardware, we don't have anything like that community. In a way, I think um, I, I'm OK. I'm over the other side. Yes, I have to wear a prosthetic. But the data in that prosthetic isn't going to be helping me save my life in the way that, say, the open APS people need to regulate insulin much more closely. So I don't think there's as much of a driver to collect this data. I'm also quite... I'm a little bit concerned about the identification. <laughs> and thank you for your good work uh, in that space. I'm a little bit concerned about the identification of data because what if my health insurer has access to that data? What if my premiums are changed? What if my coverage is cancelled, like has happened to women in the United States who've been diagnosed with breast cancer? I'm not sure that I'm comfortable with that without some strict boundaries and controls around it. Our, I think we're only just beginning to realise the assets that we have in our data and how those assets are being exploited, not necessarily in our interests. Thanks, that was a great talk. Thank you. Hello there, Kathy. Thank you so much for that um, full disclosure um, for everyone in the room. Um, I was one of the people teaching on the course that Kathy was involved in, so I'm going to put you on the spot with a question here mm -hmm. and feel free not to answer. Um, this was marks? also an assignment. This is this is not graded. Um, this is also an uh, and and uh, you mentioned that this was this was also an assignment um, for an experimental course that we're looking to improve upon and develop further. And I was wondering about your reflections on this as an educational exercise, and maybe one thing that you learned and one thing that you'd do differently in order to improve sure. this kind of thing for future. Great question. Um, so I'm I'm actually going to use the framework that you you instilled in us. I'm going to. <laughs> 
I'm going to give you one thing I learned, one thing I do differently, and one thing I'm grateful for. So one thing that I learned was how nefarious, how tricky, what an imp, what a goblin data is. It's not necessarily true. It doesn't give us the full picture. It's not clean. Data is dirty. It plays dirty tricks. So data is partial. One thing I would do differently, <laughs> um, I try and find someone I trust enough to help me put a plaster cast. <laughs> that was an exercise in futility. One thing I'm grateful for, well, there's two things I'm grateful for. Uh, obviously, I'm grateful to still be here because I still get to code and hack and play on things. I'm very grateful for the scientists that invented the drugs to make that happen. But I'm also incredibly grateful for this community because I don't think there are very many places in the world where I could have given this talk to such an incredible audience and to have it received this way. So thank you. I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank Kathy again for sharing her story and her time with us today. Please join me in thanking her again. Thank you.